Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. So good morning. Um, most of you know me by now, but if you haven't met me yet, um, my name is Bradley Spiegel, and I am leading the Building Outdoor Communities program of part of the Made by Mountains Partnership. Uh, my colleagues, Amy Allison and Joanna Brown are on this call, and we are all you know, very excited um, about this topic, especially. Uh, this topic is really near and dear to my heart, um, which I'll share with you. So we've I've named this webinar, uh, Marrying Climate Resilience and Building Vibrant Outdoor Communities. Uh, there was a paper that was released, um, and not just a paper, an incredible piece of research called Climate Resilience in Central Appalachia. And just if you're questioning Central and Southern, this in this report, Central means North Carolina as well. Um, impacts and opportunities, an analysis of projected climate crisis impacts and its implications for community and economic development in the Central Appalachian region. So Nicholas will be, tell, tell he'll, he will go much more into detail but I am going to frame the conversation first and tee it up um, because there's so many cool things to really bring to the table um, and for you all to be thinking about as you're building outdoor communities and planning for resilience at the same time. And I'm going to give you some tips. We both are gonna give you tips on how to do that. So let's start here, down in the big easy. Does this look familiar to anyone? <laughs> flooding in the Gulf Coast. This is actually where I used to live um, back in the day, um, years ago. This is just a normal flood, flooding event in 2019, um, extreme rainfall in a short amount of time. The drainage system cannot handle that amount of water. And, and this is what happens. It's, it causes street flooding. So Cities across the country and world have started to implement green infrastructure techniques. And here are some examples here. You can see there's a curb cut. And this, obviously, you may not be able to handle all of that water that I just showed you in the last picture, but maybe you could handle a couple inches of that water by diverting it into some rain gardens or bioswales on the side of the road. So if you're kind of wondering, what does green infrastructure even mean? It's really just kind of the, the sum total of all the different vegetation. It could be street trees, retention ponds, detention ponds, bioswales, rain gardens, trails, and like the, the vegetation along the trails, riparian buffers. All of the vegetation within your community together is really a green infrastructure network that is helping to make your community more resilient. It could be to wildfires, it could be for extreme heat, it could be for flooding. Um, but ultimately, the intention of this is to really think about how can we be planning, planning for our vibrant outdoor communities and trail placement at the same time as planning for resilience because at the, at the end of the day, they really go hand in hand. So I'm just gonna move through a couple other examples just to frame this narrative another rain garden in New Orleans. We're gonna move over to Greenville. And I want the intention for this is to show you, these are some projects, everyone is doing this. And I just want everyone on this call to be aware that you probably, your, your own communities are probably doing this. And now I'd like you to kind of pay attention to the landscaping that you see, because you might notice that on to the left over here, that's the Reedy River along the Swamp Rabbit Trail and it's designed to manage the extreme flood events. This is also connected to Unity Park, which is also designed for flooding. So that's just an example, some Southeastern examples. Here is the, this is the same part, same place, the parking lot um, within the Green River, within the Swamp Rabbit Trail kind of corridor of that industrial, incredible kind of adaptive reuse of the buildings. Here's the parking lot. So parking lots that are designed to flood, designed to basically with slope, so like water flows into them. Okay, we're gonna travel to historic Fourth Ward Park in Atlanta. This neighborhood in Atlanta had extreme flooding issues. And this, they, they basically were like, what can we do with this retention pond? 
And this park has become one of the most kind of, it's won awards from the Landscape Architecture Foundation. It's been turned into this incredibly beautiful public outdoor recreation asset in the middle of Atlanta. And it's ultimately a retention pond. So there's creative ways to manage stormwater in the extreme events. Okay, and this is the top of that park. Ultimately, they, the planners and designers incorporated kind of this aesthetic flow. So you can kind of showcase when it rains, the water will flow down this creek and offer kind of an educational piece for anyone. If, I mean, they'd have to be in the rain, but, but maybe if it was still in the rain, um, you would see water flowing down into the pond below. Okay, we're coming back to Western North Carolina. Um, you can see communities designing rivers or designing greenways adjacent to rivers in the floodplain. So that's happening. You can see communities. That was a sorry. That was the Yakin River Greenway in North Wilkesboro. You can see communities adapting kind of these sustainable trail principles where they're designing trails. Each segment of trail is designed to allow the water to run off as opposed to flooding on the trail. So this is Oak Hills, Oak Hill Community Park and Forest in Morganton. Haywood County has incorporated um, resilience planning into their greenway plan. So just thinking about, you know, how can, if when you're acquiring land for recreation, thinking about maybe it needs to be large enough to accommodate these bigger storm events in larger amounts of water. Because, you know, when it's not, when it's not, if it's not being used for, from a people standpoint, it could absolutely be used from a flooding standpoint. So that's kind of a key message here. Okay, so a lot of you have seen this message that I've said, kind of a North Star of building outdoor communities, planning beautiful places in harmony with nature. But ultimately, what this really means is how do we plan human systems to coexist with natural systems? And that's kind of the, the marriage. That's, we're going to get into this marriage of outdoor recreation and building outdoor communities. So you probably have also seen this slide. The impacts and opportunities of building outdoor communities are really the same for building incredible projects that manage um, against climate resilience. But you know, if we're going to go into this topic deeper, we really need to ask the question, what is resilience? And you can see from on this slide, we're talking about economic resilience, social resilience, and environmental resilience. And in a nutshell, it's really just our ability to adapt and recover quickly from changes. And that's the simplest way to say, to measure a community's resilience. Like how, how quick can we respond and get back to business as usual. Um, but ultimately, I think another key takeaway from this is environmental or natural disasters really exacerbate social and economic disasters. And, you know, or, you know, like uh, the paper mill closing in Canton, for example, an economic disaster impacts the social um, infrastructure. So we need to be really thinking about the same way we're thinking about outdoor recreation as that ecosystem approach. It's kind of the exact same model here. We need to be thinking about the whole ecosystem of climate resilience. So another key piece before I pass the baton, this is a, an incredible report that was released by the First Street Foundation about infrastructure losses and they have data about North Carolina. And this is basically just saying that there are thousands and thousands of facilities, roads, buildings that are projected to be potentially inoperable by 2100. You can see the darker areas along the coast are the ones that have the most severe kind of risks. And where are all those people going to go if they can't live on the in their coastal areas anymore? Um, they're going to come to the mountains. And that is kind of why we're having this discussion, because we want to make sure our communities are the most prepared, the most knowledgeable. And, you know, just just one little note about predictions and question, 
does the weatherman always or the weather person ever always get it right right and i think the answer is no so everything that we're projecting all this data it's it is based on the best science and the based on the best data you know and it's our i think it's as we're planning for vibrant outdoor communities it's really our objective and choice of how do we use this data how do we it might not be exactly what it's predicting but how do we really take this data and incorporate resilience planning into everything that we do so I am now going to let, I'm going to introduce Nicholas Shanahan, who is the lead author of this incredible report that was produced by Invest Appalachia. And this was a part of his thesis um, at NC State. And, you know, Invest Appalachia is a huge partner in all of the work that we're doing. Um, you can see at the top, they've also produced the downtown investment playbook to help with you know, how do you re really revitalize um, these historic, beautiful buildings in downtown? But they've also, climate analysis, the climate resilience is a huge priority for them. And so Nicholas is going to really talk about what does this mean for us? And here's one of my favorite quotes from this paper and research is, every brick and mortar project is an opportunity to increase the resilience of local infrastructure, preparing communities to adapt and to, to adapt our built environments to better withstand the impacts of climate shocks and recover more quickly. So with that being said, Nicholas Shanahan from the North Carolina Institute of, for Climate Studies will now, he will enlighten us about this research and figure out how we can use this um, in all of the work that we're doing to plan for outdoor communities. Okay, Nicholas. Uh, thank you so much, Brad. You know, Brad and I have had a, uh, a number of conversations together over coffee, and uh, I'm glad that we're having this opportunity now to bring it to everyone. We've been talking about this for a while. So yeah, my name is Nicholas Shanahan. Um, I work for the North Carolina Institute for Climate Studies. It's located here in the federal building in downtown Asheville. We're co-located with the National Centers for Environmental Information. And we are a, a research institution that is a collaboration between NOAA and uh, NC State University Sciences. For this work, I partnered with uh, Invest Appalachia. Uh, they're a wonderful regional social investment fund doing a lot of work throughout our region. Um, which, as Brad said, we sort of define okay. Central Appalachia to include Western North Carolina. Um, one thing that we noticed was that in the national sort of climate assessments, which this office just helped produce the newest one, we'll link to that at the end. Uh, but this region is so important, but it gets split up across the Southeast, the Midwest, the Northeast. And it's, it can be often hard to find really regional specific information. So we did our best. And you know, we spoke with a lot of folks to produce this white paper. Uh, that Brad is uh, linked with you. Um, my my co-authors on this, uh, main co-author is Bailey Campbell. And we had uh, tremendous support from Andrew Crossan as well. Uh, so about the analysis, we believe and we think we've really shown that Central Appalachia and with especially Western North Carolina is and is going to continue to be uh, an incredibly important site for climate adaptation at the national scale. Um, but it's underrepresented. And we also believe that in this time in the climate space, we hear so much about green tech startups, um, you know, using direct air carbon capture and AI, all these things are tools, but we really believe that there's a very, very important role for more sort of traditional community development to play. You know, access to quality healthcare, affordable, safe housing. These are some of the most important climate adaptations we can make, some of the best routes to climate resilience. And we wanted to see what does that mean for us in Western North Carolina, for the rural communities in, in Appalachia. We wanted to outline some of those challenges as well as the opportunities, especially the economic and community development opportunities that can come with 
increased uh, investment in the area and the region and within migration, as well as some of those challenges in migration might play. Uh, well, let's talk briefly, and I'll have some links where you guys can share, uh, go do some, some of your own further research, but very briefly, some of those direct physical impacts that we're experiencing and expecting to experience more here in the uh, Western North Carolina mountains. So I did an interview recently and the uh, first question that the journalist asked me was why is Appalachia, Central Appalachia climate haven? And that's a term that is quite problematic. There's no such thing as a climate haven. Uh, there's challenges everywhere and that includes here, but those are, those direct impacts are unevenly distributed. Um, as we've seen with devastating floods in Eastern Kentucky, here in Western North Carolina, uh, Eastern Tennessee, and almost anywhere in the region, we are seeing more uh, intense and frequent extreme precipitation events. We are at the same time, and those are, are, uh, are often associated with landslides. There's a term I heard, the creek comes up and the mountain comes down. I can't take credit for it, but uh, I think it's a good, good term. Um, Climate change is a story of extremes, though. So at the same time that we have more extreme precipitation events, we also have more frequent severe droughts. Uh, we are experiencing that in the last few months here in Western North Carolina, and with droughts come increased uh, wildfire risk. So much of what we do is very pertinent to uh, this, this group with the outdoor communities where we all like to recreate and where most of us live is what wildfire practitioners refer to as the wildland urban interface. Um, this poses significant challenges for combating wildfires when a wildfire becomes a structural fire. Um, that's something that we all need to be much more conscious of. Uh, again, I'll link you to, I really uh, recommend uh, Firewise USA has a, a lot of opportunities to best prepare our, our areas and communities for that. Another area of, the, of challenge that we really want to highlight and the newest national climate assessment, as well as the climate vulnerability index is really beginning to weight more heavily. And uh, we agree that it should be is the significant public health challenges posed by air quality. You know, while it is true and very important that the catastrophic events, the wildfires, the sudden floods um, are increasing and in both uh, severity and, and return period, uh, the largest impact to the public in general in a region is likely, uh, you know, worsened air quality exacerbating existing public health issues. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a societal challenge. What we focus on a lot, we'll talk here a lot about today and uh, what we talked about a lot in our, in our analysis is that climate change is really beginning to impact where Americans choose to live. So I really wanna highlight that we're, a lot of analysis you'll see is talking about, you know, forced migration, uh, people coming from other countries. Uh, but what we're seeing right now, and what we focused on is voluntary migration within the United States. People who can afford to, or for whatever circumstances, are choosing where to live, or in some cases, choosing to site their investment properties or second homes, are increasingly choosing areas that are perceived to be at lower risk of direct climate impacts. That perception is, uh, in that case, is extremely important. Uh, there's not a whole lot of information available about why people move to where they move to. You know, the uh, American Community Survey can give you wonderfully granular detail about what people paid, what they sold for, all sorts of things like that, how many number of people in a household, what their incomes are. But it doesn't ask why they moved to where they moved to. Uh, well, this year, Forbes Home did a fairly large study. I found that almost exactly one third of the Americans who moved last year that they 
interviewed cited climate change as a primary reason for choosing to move to where they did or away from where they did. And this could represent a seismic shift in national demographics over the coming years and decades. The historic trend for a number of decades now has been to the Sun Belt from the desert Southwest straight across to Florida. And those are some of the most heavily impacted areas from climate change. It's some of the most high actual risk and highest perceived risk. When in the discourse, um, areas are discussed as being less at risk, the number one region pointed to is the Great Lakes region, and for good reason. Um, one of them being that it has a physical infrastructure already in place to accept a large influx of migrants. But Appalachia also has a crucial role to play. Um, and we think, we believe strongly that that needs to be wisely managed if it is going to be a situation of a rising tide lifting all ships and not exacerbating existing social inequities. This um, from the uh, PLACE initiative, this just highlights, they did, um, along with uh, tw uh, 427 and ProPublica, this is a, a weighted meta-analysis of areas that they expect based on um, climate risk, county level, uh, counties that they expect to increase population as a result of climate change, uh, the blue being yes, the sort of teal color being a, a maybe. Everywhere else is either no change or a population loss, according to this uh, meta-analysis. And what you can see, you know, we're just going to look at broad strokes here, but you can see it's either counties near the Canadian border <laughs> or in Appalachia. So if you are in the southeast or the Carolina coast, and you're thinking about where to move to, you're likely to have more cultural ties, maybe familial ties to say Western North Carolina than say Upper Peninsula, Michigan. And that's uh, an important, those cultural ties, social ties, familial ties, very important to people when they're deciding where they wanna live. So uh, why do people wanna move here? <laughs> So the physical direct impacts in many cases are less than some other areas. For example, we clearly don't have to worry about sea level rise. Um, and while we do have to worry about extreme precipitation, including from uh, Atlantic cyclones, we're not worried about the devastating storm surge uh, or as much, you know, the, the high category devastating um, uh, wind damage associated with landfalling hurricanes. We don't have the extreme heat up here in the mountains. We have these wonderful mild summers. And uh, I think colloquially, a lot of people would say, wouldn't mind if our winters were a bit shorter and a tiny bit warmer. All this goes into that perception of risk, which again, in, in those cases is true. And we're also in close proximity relative to say, New England, uh, to some very high risk places like coastal North Carolina, or it's still a lot closer to Florida than it is than, uh, you know, if you're coming from Florida, it's a lot closer to come here than it is to go to North Dakota, for example. And so this is leading to climate in migration. We believe uh, from our analysis that what is known as climate gentrification is already happening here, which is when people are citing their investment properties, second, third homes, they're seeing the risk associated with coastal properties and low-lying areas, and they're looking for a place that they perceive to be a better investment. And that includes much of Western North Carolina. Asheville is at the top of many people's lists. New York Times did a, a story about, uh, uh, say, a well-heeled a family in California who had uh, nice homes in both California and Florida, and they were looking for across the nation for somewhere to move that they thought to retire and be safer 
from climate change. Lo and behold, they chose Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, I saw another story, a different couple along the same lines who also moved to North Asheville, North Carolina. So we are on the national radar as a place to go to be safer from climate change. Uh, again, it's about that perception of risk. But that itself can doesn't change a lot of the existing inequalities that have, a, that have been here in this region for generations. And we want to try our best to not have it be a situation where it's another form of extraction, this time basically a land grab by outside interests. And while we are at less risk of certain direct impacts of climate change relative to some other regions, a region's ability to withstand shocks is separate from what those shocks are. We can't necessarily control those climate shocks, but the social, the political and economic factors have a huge impact on how we can respond or withstand those shocks. And Appalachia, uh, you know, it's a little different here in Buncombe County, of course, but the rural parts of, of Western North Carolina included, we still have relatively poor health infrastructure. We still have chronic underinvestment. Um, all those chronic problems won't just go away because people with are coming and building high dollar homes. And in fact, they can get worse when people come in and drive up properties, driving up, drives up insurance rates, which drives up property taxes, which in many people often is, uh, you know, multi-generational properties that people could only afford to stay in because of the low property taxes, of the low insurance. And if those people are forced to sell or coerced into selling, where do they go? They become marginalized peoples. And they will likely have to move to a place that is more at risk. If we're seeing this on smaller scale. You can see case studies, a famous one being a uh, little maybe a little Haiti neighborhood of Miami, where a place that was traditionally very cheap happens to be at a, a few feet higher elevation relative to sea level. And so suddenly its prices have skyrocketed, and the people who were immigrants, many of them from Haiti. Uh, from, but uh, you know, Caribbean immigrants are being forced out of there and into lower lying areas. Similar type things can happen on a broader scale with rural gentrification. Now for some, maybe a little bit better news. <laughs> um, this is brand new, the Climate Vulnerability Index put out by Environmental Defense Fund and Texas A&M. Uh, light colors are good in this case. Dark colors is economic and productivity losses. And what you can see is you can see the Blue Ridge Mountains reaching down from Pennsylvania all the way down through Western North Carolina up to North Georgia. These are areas that are expected to have as least vulnerable economies. And, and, the, and again, it's that same story. Until you get all the way up into basically New England or up into Michigan, the only place around where you see those light colors is right here in Western North Carolina and in Appalachia. And so that, like I said, this just came out maybe a month ago. I really encourage you, I have a link at the end, to go spend some time with this Climate Vulnerability Index. This is just one particular uh, metric. They have a lot, and they don't all paint the same rosy picture of, uh, of Western North Carolina. For example, extreme uh, exposure, the rising exposure to droughts and wildfires, especially air quality issues uh, are are really going to continue to be a problem here. But on the economic side, there's a lot of opportunity here and we want to harness that. This is a similar, this is an older analysis published in 2017, completely separate, paints a similar picture. The green is negative damage or economic growth. So two different analyses, uh, uh, six years, seven years apart, painting a similar type of picture. There's a lot of economic growth opportunity tied to climate change here in Western North Carolina and in our surrounding region. Uh, and that's where we think creative placemaking can, and building outdoor communities can play a role in all of these. 
uh, what's at risk of losing a cultural identity here as more people move in? How can the outdoor communities, outdoor recreation, place-based tourism play a role in integrating newcomers, telling the story of a place here? And as people come to vacation here or move here and recreate, uh, how can that bolster local economies? How can the design adapt to both more extreme precipitation events and more frequent extreme drought events? Um, and how do we get more people involved in loving this place? Um, I'm just going to go through this real quick. We think that there's excellent uh, opportunity for smallholder agriculture here. Um, and then, again, community health. I, I think that there's a real opportunity in the outdoor communities for this point to mental health services. It's only beginning to be studied or it's being studied more now. But the link between climate change, spe specifically uh, heat waves, extreme heat events, and negative mental health outcomes is very strong. It's a very strong correlation. Um, and it seems natural to me that the outdoor, you know, outdoor communities can play a very helpful role in that. Um, one thing to be aware of is vector-borne diseases are, are, are really becoming more of an issue here. I'm sure a lot of you have plenty of uh, colloquial experience with that. And how can we use, you know, what Brad was talking about, uh, the with green design, blue design, uh, heat island reduction, community cooling centers. These are in, in, very important to a region that in a lot of areas, people don't have, you know, homes weren't built for heat and many places, many people, their homes or their office buildings or their schools don't have air conditioning. And then uh, we, we really wanted to have a lot of time for discussion today. These are just some questions that, whether it be email or come up today, that we here at NKIX and as well as the folks at Best Appalachia, but we wanna know from you, what are your needs and concerns and blind spots we might have about for the scientific community, for the research community that you need to know or would like to know questions you have about the direct impacts of climate change or even as they might tie to economic outcomes, health outcomes. Um, that's something that we deal a lot with here as well, especially the, the health outcomes. And yeah, I'll, uh, we'll probably put a lot of these in, uh, in an email for you guys later, but uh, the new National Climate Assessment 5 just came out. Like I said, a lot of the researchers here at NCIX play pivotal roles in producing that. I um, also wanna say that the North Carolina Climate Science Report has a wonderful section specifically on the Western Mountains. And as when we were doing our research, uh, we really used that as a proxy for the region because there aren't a whole lot of uh, mountainous region specific climate assessments. But that is a very good one. Again, primarily produced right here at, uh, at INCIX. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Brad. I think you've heard me talking enough here. And I'll give you a break, but thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Nicholas. That was a lot of information. And I bet you're all thinking, where do we go from here? Right? Um, <clears throat> it's a lot to take in. And I, I don't think it could be, you know, I think this is the first step is us just having this discussion. Um, I think the most important key takeaway from this information is we need to know our own risk. What are your community risks? That's part, that is the first step of resilience planning is how do you know what your risk is? We can help you figure that out. Nicholas is saying that if you have questions about what is your risk, he has access to tools and data that you could use to tell your story. Um, I think from a BOC standpoint, we really should just start talking about it in 2024. 
let's start integrating resilience into everything that we're talking about with trails. How can trails be a, a, a an outcome or a solution to to combat some of this these resilience challenges and opportunities? So I think understanding the data that's available, integrating climate resilience, like I just said, into our discussions. And I, I encourage you all to think about what is your unique narrative? You know, how do you tell your story to a funder? Um, what's, what, what excites me about that is, is like, if you can, if you have, if you use the data, if you look at the data to understand what your risks are, and some of this isn't rocket science, but some of it, it might be helpful to just amplify your narrative. Uh, what are your risks and how can you really tell the story to go after funding? So what are some good funding tools that you think that could be applicable that blend outdoor recreation and um, climate resilience? I'm going to tell you. So, but before we knew that, this is kind of know your risk. If you know your risk, then you can know what your opportunity is. If you know your risk, you can figure out what are the right solutions. Do we need to be creating kind of ecological buffers in strategic places in the wild urban in wildland urban interface to combat wildfires? Do we need to be helping educate the public on how to properly manage their forests in order to not you know, create forest fires on accident? Um, stuff like that. Like there's just, there's ways that we can start to implement some of this stuff. With this um, from the Nicholas's website, the Institute for the Climates, North Carolina Institute for Climate Sciences, there's a link to this report that I just found yesterday in preparing for this discussion is, I encourage you, this is your homework, to go to the key messages. And there's three amazing, very simple talking points about North Carolina that you all could be using in your, in your discussions with elected officials, um, building outdoor community stakeholders, very cool. And it just, it's really just integrating this into the discussions um, as a whole. Another kind of piece of data at your fingertips, and some of you may have been here last week at the Blue Ridge Rising Symposium, um, Destination by Design really helped to synthesize a resilience framework for the Blue Ridge um, territory. And so this is another piece of data that we can be looking at. They, there's 25 indicators that talk about different factors of economic, social, and environmental um, considerations that we should be thinking about as we're planning for solutions all across the outdoor economic ecosystem. Another interesting tool that's kind of in development is this Land of Sky Regional Council Regional Assessment um, Project. And they've created a, they've partnered with the University of North Carolina, Asheville and their Fernleaf um, program and created an Excel Adapt. I encourage you to check it out. It's circled here. It's basically a, a parcel by parcel inventory of, of um, risk, flood risk, flood risk and vulnerability. So anyway, this is just kind of a summary of, of different data that's out there that again, if you need help um, figuring out like what data is applicable to you, you can reach out to Nicholas or I and we can figure out what is the best suitable information for you to develop your narrative. Okay, so back to the funding, the funding that blends outdoor recreation and resilience planning. I think the Land of Water Fund is probably the best example of something like this. You can see here, I highlighted that they um, are prioritizing public access um, in outdoor recreation, um, opportunity, like for outdoor recreation projects. It does have to manage water or manage water quality or protect a river, uh, increase a buffer, a, rip, a, riparian, a riparian buffer. So that's just something to think about is how can you be, if you know your risk in your communities and you're thinking about outdoor recreation potential, um, where is the floodplain? That's a really good question. You know, how could we be kind of um, using our open space to combat some of these issues, but also um, using it for passive recreation development? So that's one opportunity. Um, I, I put the contact information for these for this fund because it, every on their websites it says just reach out to these people 
to ask if you, you know, just to inquire about a specific project. If you have an idea that's brewing in your head, just a simple email before you go through the, through the trouble of filling out an application. But the next um, grant cycle is opening in January for Land and, Water, Land and Water Fund. Another opportunity is the Water Resources Development Grant Program with NCDEQ. Um, you can reach out to Kevin here. This one is really in, in particular um, for um, recreational information. Wait, sorry, let me just take that back. Blue Way Infrastructure Development. So any type of recreational asset that takes place on a river or a creek or a stream, they could fund projects for that, for the infrastructure development, access point um, design and development. So that's a cool in opportunity. And then the final one, and this is more at the state level, but is the building resilient infrastructure in communities through FEMA. Um, each state applies for hazard mitigation funding, but local jurisdictions can also be sub recipients of this. So just be thinking if you wanna reach out to them to ask if your project could be applicable, FEMA also has a lot of money for these types of proactive planning measures um, for resilience planning. Okay, so that was, that is kind of the discussion and Nicholas had some great questions for you all. And um, we would love to hear from you. Like, how is this landing? Uh, if you wanna raise your hand or just unmute yourself and to say your name and where you're from. So Nicholas has some context and we can have a nice discussion. Don't be shy. I will just say thanks for this presentation today. I think the new thing that was for me was about the um, social resilience and what we may have to um, impact us with wildfires or whatever that may be. So I appreciate the time doing this about um, that resilience. Thanks, Beth. Tell tell Nicholas where you're from. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry, I'm from Valdez, Burke County. And so we've done land and water grants and um, water resources grants and used to all that flood mitigation and stormwater and regular stuff. So we're kind of used to that, but I, I appreciate the part, like I was saying about the um, medical or social issues and all that. So that was new to me. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Beth. It's nice to meet you. Let's move to Scott. I think you started talking. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, this is Scott Needham and Pilot Mountain. Um, we just something we ran into. I don't. I don't know if you're aware, but um, when we were trying to install um, rain gardens on Main Street here in Pilot Mountain, um, our Main Street, like a lot of people's Main Street, is managed by DOT, and um, that was not a. Um, that was not a. Uh, not. Um, what am I trying to say? Not a use uh, a rain uh, stormwater use that they were um, accustomed to, and they would not um, accept that um, rain gardens as a as a um, drainage use. Um, that's uh, you know I'm I'm <laughs> I'm the chairman of the RPO uh, in Northwest uh, North Carolina uh, or Piedmont, and uh, it's something that I've brought to their attention. Um, another thing. Um, is uh, the um, the uses um, on the development end, um, the uses that uh, cities such as Winston-Salem, for instance, um, will allow for um, drained water, um, stormwater, um, uh, not retention, but uh, getting, moving stormwater um, is, um, it's pretty narrow as far as what they'll agree to um so it's just something i don't know if other people have had that problem or um but it's something that we've had to work with um so thank you does anyone want to respond to that with how how did you have you been able to overcome that challenge of working with dot or or do you know a different angle with dot that does accept 
these types of stormwater management measures? Right. So what we ended up having to do was we just told them that we would take care of the road. Um, hmm. So we just, yeah, that's what we ended up having to do. Um, a lot of the things we're trying to do in Pilot Mountain, because we're named after a mountain, um, is do these climate control um, or climate um, friendly um, things such as uh, diverting storm water to plants and things like that instead of just, you know, sending that on down the, the road um, and um, capturing um, uh, uh, chemicals and things coming off of uh, roadways and uh, filtering that stuff out um, to keep our streams clean. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, so yeah, unfortunately we weren't able to get past that. We just took over the road. So. Hmm. Thank you for sharing. And Scott, I'm sure you know uh, you can you should qualify for some power bill funds in the future. It probably will not offset what the DOT was doing by maintaining all of it, but there the power bill money will hopefully help you guys a little bit down the road when you gotta repave or something like that. Darren, say who you are, please. Uh, of course, Darren Lewis in Mount Airy, North Carolina. Again, thank you guys for, um, you know, having this today. Some great information. No question, Mount Airy has been a huge benefactor of, you know, greenway development, stream restoration, uh, trying to deal with some flood control projects. So this is right up our alley. We appreciate you guys uh, leading this effort and, you uh, you know, some of the data on relocating is uh, was very interesting as we're part of Retire NC and mm -hmm. they've got some really good data as well on relocation so that you may want to even look at some of their information that could possibly help. And you could piggyback on some of that as well about especially uh, people moving to rural, rural communities. Thank you. Huh. Yeah, thank you, Dan. I will look into that. Appreciate it. Hey, and this, I'm sorry, this is Scott one more time. I just want to say how Darren and Mount Airy has done an awesome job with uh, mitigating their flood stuff. I, I, I'm, I go on the Greenway quite often and they've done a really good job. And also partnering with AARP when you're talking about that retirement community and um, the funds you can get from them with uh, doing improvements to such things as greenways and stuff like that. But sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> oh, you're good. Um, I was just gonna say that um, with some of the resiliency work that we're doing, we're actually working on a state park in Buncombe County. And one of the things that we were able to talk state parks into was doing a resiliency and sustainability overlay and specifically mm -hmm. looking at um, flooding and drought and uh, fire and also impacts to biodiversity as a result of more opportunities for invasive plants and insects to kind of take over. And so um, we're really um, interested to see kind of the results that we'll pull together because I think um, we, we've heard about fire, flooding, droughts being an issue in our region. So we're trying to now find the design applications to help with that because um, we're planning and design firm. We're located in Asheville, North Carolina here. Um, and so, um, is it, is it, is it green infrastructure? Is it fire wise landscape design? Is it, you know, you mentioned the urban heat island. So parking lots are a major issue with that getting shade covered. Um, so what are some of the strategies? And so I think we're looking forward to having, um, the opportunity to identify and uh, try to, um, apply those because for example, we have great, um, when we look at trail sustainable trail design, there's guidelines for that. We have guidelines. There's lots of documentation on that. But what do we have for guidelines for designing resiliency and actual the applications that go on the ground in the landscape? We have a lot of information for stormwater, um, but what about some of these other items that we could really look at with flooding? Because um, a lot of the things that, Scott, you're talking about, bioretention and rain gardens and bioswales, that's really great for water quality. But a lot of times when we're having these heavy downpours, those systems can't really treat that water and then becomes a quantity issue. And how do we how do we manage the flooding impacts? So those are some real issues that um, we've been trying to grapple with ourselves and look forward to trying to apply these more to outdoor recreation projects. Thanks, David. And 
if you don't, if you didn't, I don't think you said this, but he's with uh, Equinox Environmental. Huh. Anyone else? Some questions or thoughts? How did this land for you? I have a question that I'd like to ask if anyone, if, if, if everyone's quiet. Um, Nicholas, um, yes. in the recommendation section of this report, mm -hmm. there's a, there is, when we're talking about funding for like resilience projects or adapt climate change adaptation projects, there was talk about a fund or a recommendation that there should be a fund, an investment fund. And I'm curious, is there a status of some sort of a funding mechanism for communities in Western North Carolina if they want to apply for funding if it's a climate adaptation project? Um, if it's okay, I, uh, I know that we do have from Invest Appalachia here, Baylin Campbell and uh, Andrew Cross, and they might be able to, I'm sorry to call you all out, but they could probably speak more to that. Um, you know, here at the institution, we're, uh, we we get our funding from the national government, but uh, I see Andrew's popped on and they are the guys to speak to. So uh, I'll invite you. Hello, Andrew. Andrew, CEO hey, of Nicholas. Invest Appalachia. Hey, Nicholas. Um, can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks, Bradley. Uh, thanks, Nicholas. Um, so it's a great question, Bradley. Um, that was a recommendation from us in the paper uh, based on an existing fund that uh, that serves um, coastal areas. So there is an example precedent. Uh, the case we make is that there's precedent for a federally funded, nonprofit managed uh, resilience fund. Uh, there is one that focuses on coastal wetlands uh, that a colleague of Nicholas's at NOAA actually informed me about. Um, and so that was sort of a call to action to say, um, there is no reason that uh, the federal government, let alone philanthropy, couldn't seed a fund focused on climate resilience in the Appalachian region for all of the reasons that Nicola shared uh, and, and for why that's critical. So we are advocating for capital to come into the region specifically to support the sorts of projects that, that you all have been talking about that are embedding climate resilience in community. Uh, that is a work in progress, <laughs> to put it uh, nicely. Um, but we do uh, have resources. We have a, an investment fund that provides repayable investment for larger scale projects, we partner with Mountain Bizworks and other uh, community lenders in the region um, around that. And we do have um, a sort of a, a pilot pool of capital focused on climate resilience that's meant to help overcome barriers to investment. So we're very focused on investable propositions. As Nicola shared, a lot of the projects that are needed to build climate resilience are actually investable propositions, right? You're talking about real estate, you're talking about businesses, you're talking about housing. Uh, downtown development, things like that. So if there are projects in those categories that have a climate resilience angle, um, we would love to hear about them and, and try to work together to figure out uh, flexible investment solutions. The big dream of a na of a nationally funded Appalachian Climate Resilience Fund uh, is, still, is still in the dream phase, but uh, we're hoping that can um, gradually come to fruition over the next year or two. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, that was really helpful. Wow. Um, so the coastal, so it's a coastal fund and it's being implemented, like coastal communities are using this currently. That's kind of, okay. Wow, that was really yeah, interesting. And what's unique about it or why we thought it was worth noting in the report is that, um, you know, we didn't go so far as to have, uh, you know, be advocating for specific federal policies, but we said, hey, there, there, there are things that we can explore that have been tried in other contexts uh, with similar intent. So the fact that it's federally funded um, through, I think, Fish and Wildlife Service and then managed by, uh, and Balin just dropped the uh, um, the chat in there, um, you know, it's managed outside of the federal government. So there, there are mechanisms whereby you could have regional control and even um, priority setting for for those funds, even though they're federally mandated funds. So we thought that was just an exciting solution because the federal government has, you know, access to a scale of resources that are perhaps appropriate for the scale of the, the situation that we're talking about here. Yeah, Thank and I you. would just, uh, just yeah. add, to kind of add to that, one thing that we were trying to do with this paper, and I think that all of us can do, is to advocate for this region that, well, you know, by, the Appalachian Regional Commission's count, 
or definition of the of Appalachia writ large, we're talking about 26 million Americans already live in the region. That's a lot of people. And while it's true that sea level rise and landfalling hurricanes are represent this immediate damage, immediate risk to an incredible amount of property value. That's why we're seeing so much investment in coasts right now. Those people have to move somewhere too. There's already 26 million people here. It's going to increasingly become an important site for national climate adaptation. And so we're really trying to highlight and and put a spotlight on our region for why there should be that that investment now. Um, and that's something that all of us can all of us can do um, instead of it just being people individually choosing to to move here and build, you know, if they have the investment capital up front to build their own uh, uh, property. And how can we make the case that we you know we need we want federal dollars, we want national level uh, philanthropy investment, national level, just business investment. Uh, and we believe the case is there to be made, and, and we've tried to, uh, we've tried to do that, and uh, and we'll continue to, and hopefully that uh, you know all of us can can put that that framing to use. Thank you so much, Andrew and Nicholas, for that insight. Um, maybe one more question, and then we'll, we'll we will close it out. If there's any other question. Is there any plan for, is there like a, an immediate next step for this research? It would, it's, uh, what's happening with it? Yeah, so uh, Andrew and, and Balin and I um, have been in early talks to, with the National Climate Assessment 5 coming out, with that Climate Vulnerability Index coming out, you know, climate, uh, the state of climate change science is incredibly uh, exciting. It's never boring. There's always new data coming out and always new information coming out. And especially as we're beginning to get into what are those economic impacts? What are those health impacts? Um, so, you know, we're hoping to do a sort of uh, addendum or, or kind of a follow-up that incorporates some of this, some of this uh, new emerging data. I'm hoping to have that in the first few months of, of next year. Um, and we are also, I'm trying to uh, trying to agitate from the inside a little bit now that uh, National Climate Assessment 5 is more or less, it's been released. There's still work to be done. Um, but can, we're hoping to get a region-specific climate assessment uh, made because, like I said, this area, if you look at the intersection of West North Carolina, Southwest Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, West Virginia, Appalachian parts of Ohio, Pennsylvania, kind of the central Appalachian region. Uh, in most climate assessments, national level climate assessments, those get split up. Even states that are border states can be in three different, three different border states can be in three different climate regions. Uh, so we're really trying to get, uh, you know, sort of the big guns of climate science, NOAA, NCEI, NCEI to do a downscaled uh, Appalachia, Central Appalachia specific uh, climate assessment. And we will, that'll be an ongoing effort. But one thing that y'all can do is you let me know that uh, that it's needed and would be helpful. And I can pass that up the, up the chain. That's sort of how government science works. So and thank you all. Kind of, yeah. Reiterating what you said before, Nicholas, that if there's, if these community leaders uh, need specific data, like Nicholas can, he has an opportunity to tailor his research to what you all need. So if there's specific things you're looking for, or what would, what would, what would be most beneficial to you, just reach out to either one of us and we will help to kind of make this research more adaptable and more tailored to what your specific needs are. So yes. with that, oh yeah, did you want to? I was just going to say, I was just going to echo that. Absolutely. We actually love to hear that feedback from the community and from stakeholders that uh, that just doesn't get brushed aside. It gets implemented. So please do reach out. 
So, well, thank you so much for joining us, Nicholas and Andrew and Balin. Thank you for making a guest appearance. Um, this has been great. This webinar will be recorded and I'll send it out or has been recorded. I will send it out um, next week. So we appreciate you for being here and I hope this was helpful. Um, we will send out all the links in a follow-up email as well. So happy holidays and have a great rest of the day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Of course.